welcome to the next session at Group I, in which Pedro Lopez, Lono Lopes, <laughs> see, I'm going to get it right here. So now the next session, uh, Pedro is going to cover gems to help you troubleshoot query performance. And you notice that his slide deck has a Microsoft thing on it. That means he's not like the rest of us who are faking it, just to, you know, kind of trying to get in from the outside. He's actually inside the, the big monster here. So take it away, Pedro. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, this session will uh, mainly um, is, is mainly a vehicle to let you know and then be kind of uh, evangelization of the work we've been doing in the last year or so um, about um, adding troubleshooting um, artifacts, if you will, to the engine all around to make just the the um, the ability to troubleshoot query performance just that much faster and that's mu that much uh, focused. So the objectives I had set for today would be to show you what new diagnostic improvements we have in SQL Server Engine. Some of you will already have had contact with some of these. Others, uh, hopefully, this will be news for you and you can start using them. Uh, we'll learn how to use this, some of these new, new diagnostics to troubleshoot the common performance issues, and I'm going to take you through through several of them. So here's a generic question though. When was the last time that you actually dealt with a query performance issue? Um, we here get the Tiger team, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the activities we have is actually to receive escalations from the field and from customers, and a lot of them have to do with uh, performance issues, namely query performance issues. And uh, those can have a different, uh, a different variety of root causes, uh, but it is very common that even our CSS gets a heavy load of uh, query performance um, troubleshooting topics. So uh, I'll take you through a, a couple of fundamentals just to make sure that everyone's on the same on the same page as we progress through the session. So how does or well, why does a query slow down? There are a number of uh, questions that you must ask yourself. Uh, and the number of um, root causes that may, may explain why, generically speaking, a query slowdown. So most often uh, you will have excessive resource consumption, though, so that can be either your CPU is running high or you're doing a lot of I.O. And uh, every, every of those, all of those aspects, even running uh, with a high memory, all those aspects that you actually feel in SQL Server as the instance, it all boils down to ineffective queries or ineffective use of resource uh, um, in, inside your server. So those can be driven by poor indexing strategy, for instance, in whereas your index design was probably once upon a time, it was good enough for your workload, but as your workload kind of uh, changed in its profile or actually your data uh, size grew, that index may, may prove not to be reliable anymore. And therefore it will trigger a number of uh, other issues, namely excessive resource consumption. So another topic is you may lack useful statistics. Um, and the engine has been becoming smarter, has become smarter in using, uh, for example, in 2016, it's, it's using again multi-column statistics and we're only loading the statistics that are actually uh, found to be needed for the optimizer rather than in previous versions where we just basically loaded everything. Um, or you may be facing, for example, lack of useful partitioning. And that has to do directly with the case where your data has gr grown and that has uh, like tipped over uh, some performance um, uh, some performance aspect. And then, therefore, uh, you need to start uh, using um, uh, strategies like partitioning to handle your data. Now, another um, as another category may have to do with block queries. So not necessarily excessive resource consumption, but just queries take time and time forever because somewhere uh, there's a blocking chain and, and some query is blocking a number of others. And, it, and this is, the last one is, is rarer, but it happens. For example, incorrect server configurations. Um, and those may have to do with, for example, um, you are running a lot of uh, ad hoc workload and you hit for perhaps some uh, compilation um, uh, bottleneck. So you can, you can change some server or database configurations to handle uh, those sorts of scenarios. And uh, the context has to be set when you're analyzing uh, slow queries. So it may not be necessarily that SQL Server is the culprit when a user calls in and says, hey, my application is slow. 
but it can be related to another component that is outside a SQL Server itself, for example, slow network performance, or um, I can have some other service running in the server that may be causing performance deg degradation, for example, taking a lot of memory or consuming a lot of CPU, and that's being, becoming concurrent with SQL Server process itself. Um, but then if, if, it has, if it is SQL Server itself, then obviously, SQL Server only has an issue if you're running queries, and therefore uh, the query um, the query plan shape might be an aspect to look at. And you need to understand if you if you have issues with queries all across the board, or you are able to identify a specific subset of those queries. And if so, you then can uh, drill down and start to look at whether you have optimized the query with useful statistics. And we actually have uh, some useful information here. Uh, do I have suitable indexes available? Is my index design still uh, up to date in what relates to my, the predicates I'm running? Um, do I have any hot spots in my data? Or when I'm looking at my query performance, am I hitting some uh, parameter sensitivity issue, for instance? Um, and, and those are a number of questions you need to kind of find the answer to scope down from a big, um, a big sentiment, if you will, which is the user calls in and says, my application is slow or my database, uh, your database is slow, and drill it down to some, some aspects that you can actually uh, tackle with. So how do I analyze the performance of a slow running query? And, uh, and at this point, I've, I've gotten to, to, to a point where I've, I was able to drill down and understand it as a subset of queries, for example, that is slow running. So here are some of the tools that we're going to be using today. Showplan XML is something that we've been investing heavily in the past year. We've added a lot of um, relevant information to Showplan, essentially to make it a one-stop gap, uh, one-stop shop, sorry, to to uh, get the context as we're analyzing a, a query plan and kind of avoid going back and forth, uh, getting data from other DMVs or getting data from, from other sources to kind of complete the picture. Because it is important when you're analyzing query performance to also understand the context in which could the query execute. Uh, we'll also be using Query Store, the plan comparison tool, which is kind of an Easter egg we kind of uh, released a year and a half ago, and we've been investing on it to make it smarter. Live Query Stats, again, we have made several investments in the engine itself to make this, uh, this, um, this feature uh, more usable in, in a day-to-day -day basis. And X events, obviously, we've been investing in X events. That's the, uh, the de facto... Um, um, troubleshooting artifact, if you will, that we that we have all across the engine and, and across most new features. So, yeah, OK. So a query plan will include um, a lot of useful information. You, by looking at the query plan, you can understand how the data is accessed by looking at the baseline operators that skip the seeks and the scans, if you will, how the data is joined. So what type of physical join are we using to resolve what kind of uh, uh, logical join? Also the sequence of operations, because um, uh, unless we instruct the engine otherwise, you, you, if you're joining several tables, there will be some join optimizations happening. So the sequence of the, um, of the operations may not be exactly the same as you've set textually in your query. And you may see, for example, uh, work tables uh, or, or uh, uh, other artifacts showing up in the engine, in the plan that you were not accounting for. And those may be relevant depending on whether you have warnings or not. Also, understanding what, what size of data flow. So not only the estimations, but the actual data flow. So the amount of rows that are flowing from one operator to the other and the costs for each of those steps and the cost that is that goes upstream. That is super important to understanding, for example, in a very uh, complex uh, plan. What is What are the nodes that are most relevant that I really should focus on? And again, we've been making some investments there to make it easier for you to identify that. Um, whether you're using parallelism or not, do I have warnings? Um, what are the, the execution stats? So a number of, uh, of relevant information is right there in show plan that will allow you to not only understand how the query is getting executed, but hopefully, and with information we've been getting in, and I will show you today why certain decisions were, were taken and how to mitigate them, if you will. So, uh, and, and this will be my last slide on the fundamentals, if you will. Uh, it's the notion of understanding uh, fingerprinting. So query fingerprints and query plan fingerprints. And why is this important? Because 
as we move through several DMVs, as we compare plans with, with the output of certain DMVs and DMFs um, and, and even X events, we need to correlate the information. So if we're talking about queries and query plans, so we need to some, some way to fingerprint them and to univocally uh, identify them in the system. So we have the query hash, for instance, that, that will explicitly identify a specific query in the entire plan cache. And that's, we, we designate that as a query hash. It's a query fingerprint, essentially. You can use them to filter, for example, CZM exec requests, CZM exec query stats, and get some uh, insight into either your in-flight requests or uh, queries that have already uh, ran and you, we, we are capturing some performance stats. Now, there is also the SQL handle. Basically, this is the token that identifies the SQL text that relates to a batch. So for example, you can use the SQL handle uh, to join different DMFs and DMVs. CZM exec SQL text is the DMF that is mostly used for you to grab the exact query text of a, a, certain, um, a certain output, for example, from CZM exec requests or query stats. Um, then there is a notion of fingerprinting the query plans. And query plan hash will be the, um, th that, that piece of data. So it will be the specific fingerprint to determine a specific execution plan within the scope that you have in the query in the, the, the plan cache. And you can even, for example, uh, just with these two pieces of data, do some interesting exercises. For example, I may be able to identify that one query hash actually may have more than one query plan hash in the plan cache. For example, if two different users are connecting independently and they have a different set options in, in the, um, in the uh, uh, connection, uh, those may drive the different um, decisions by the optimizer. And therefore, you may even find two different plans uh, in the cache for the same uh, uh, specific query hash. So those can be, that, that can be useful exercise for you to determine whether you have this kind of scenario. And finally, the plan handle. This, similarly to the SQL handle, is a, a, a token for that specific cache execution plan that again you can use in DMFs or, or DMVs such as you see on the screen. So establishing these fundamentals, because we'll, we'll talk about some of these uh, topics as we progress through the session, we'll use this information. So I just wanted to establish this. So we move on to our uh, diagnostics and troubleshooting enhancements we've been doing over the past year. Now taking the, the we've just talked about um, query hash and query plan hash. And those are actually actions in X events, because if you're capturing a X event collection, you can capture that, the, that piece of information that you can then later correlate to some DMF or DMP that we've seen. Now, one problem that the, you guys in the community have identified and, and, and uh, opened the connect item that, that's been there for, for some time that we, we, we have taken care of now is, uh, hey, when I collect my X event uh, session, actually the query hash and the query plan hash that is there, I can't use it because, I mean, when I when I, I try to use it to filter out, for example, CZM exec query stats, I can't find a, a I can't find that query there. So that actually made it difficult to correlate the information. And I know that I think a couple of years ago or three years ago, there was someone actually in Microsoft CSS that came up with a CLR um, to kind of um, uh, mitigate this, this um, difficult correlation. But it, it was still something you needed to deploy on, on your server and actually know about it. So what have we done? In 2016 RTM, and, and we backported this in 2014 SP2, uh, one of the main uh, uh, missions of our team, the Tiger team, is actually to understand not only what we can improve in vNext, in whatever comes, comes in the next version, but also understand what we can bring back as much as possible to add value to in-market versions. And, and this is just another case that we did. So not only did we ship this in 2016 RTM, but we backported to 2014 SP2. So we added two new actions, as you can see there on the screen, query hash signed and query plan hash signed. And those will actually be the same data type and the same exact hash that you will find in, in uh, the engine DMVs. So now it becomes much easier to correlate this information between X events and like RPC completed, for example, and some DMVs like we've seen. And I'm actually going to see, going to have a uh, one small example of this for the double line. Uh, another, another, uh, another problem space we we set out to resolve in this past year is 
try as much as possible to avoid round trips, meaning um, you have a query performance issue. You are a DBA or, or a dev in your, in your organization and someone complains and uh, you get the actual execution plan, for example, but that doesn't really have all the information that maybe you require. So you do another round trip and this is especially, um, especially harmful when we're talking about you opening a case with Microsoft um, and you send them the actual execution plan, for example, thinking that, hey, you have all the all you need to tell me why my query is behaving badly and give me a mitigation for that. But then you get uh, you get a phone call saying, hey, we need to collect information from this DMV. We need to understand if trace flags were active or I need to understand uh, what IO we did in this query. So please collect set statistics IO. So a number of round trips are perhaps required to, for, for every engineer that is analyzing query performance to get the full scope and the full context. And that is kind of frustrating. So we set out to try to correct that as much as possible. And for example, up to SQL Server 2016, um, the, the, the three pieces of information you see in bold there, actual rows, actual end of scans and actual executions, those were the only pieces of data you had in the scope of a, a, an operator in Showplan XML. So I would click on a scan and I would see how many rows I, I output from that scan, uh, how many scans that were actually did and, and how many executions were, were done. That's it, no more information. So I needed to resort to uh, other DMVs and other artifacts in the engine to actually get some more information. So what we did in 2016 and 2014 SP2 was to include a lot of this missing information by default in the actual execution plan. It's actual because these are all uh, runtime um, performance um, uh, performance uh, counters. So we they're only collected at, at runtime. So as you can see, we've added the elapsed milliseconds and the CPU time that each operator uh, took. We now have information about the logical reads and physical reads and read ahead. So all the IO information for each operator that actually does IO. And that's all included under the runtime counters per thread inside Showplan XML. Actually, in 2016 SP1, we included some more information, in this case about memory grants. You can see them in, in, in the bottom there. Uh, we know for certain operators like sorts, for example, or, or, or uh, hash operations, we now have information about the input memory grant and the use memory grant. That is super important to get the context of whether um, the, that plan executed with a, a reasonable amount of memory or better, better put, if it was given, if it was granted a reasonable amount of memory for what it actually used. If you see a huge gap there, that's a symptom of uh, perhaps uh, misestimations and you need, need to, to take some action there. Uh, just a, a note uh, when you're actually looking at these um, these um, uh, runtime counters is that if you're looking at row mode operators, for example, you have a, a couple of uh, seeks and they're being joined. Um, you will have this runtime counters per each of the seeks. And when you look at the join, you will actually see uh, the values uh, are being uh, pushed up the tree, meaning the join will have um, runtime information on itself, jo um, summing with the, the, the performance uh, counters of the children. Now for batch mode operators, and that has to do with the way we, we measure performance for batch mode inside the engine, you'll actually see singleton values. So you won't see the, the values uh, summing up the tree. Just, uh, just a, a quick note there in case uh, you kind of find uh, um, strange when you're analyzing mixed mode uh, plans. So here's how we actually see that information exposed. So in uh, you can in this case I'm I was clicking on a cluster index scan and I can see information exposed about the actual IO statistics. This means that for all intents and purposes I can do away with the round trip of uh, requesting someone to run the query again with set statistics IO. I don't need them anymore. I have the information right there. Um, I can see there on on the on the right how that is exposed inside the Showplan XML in case I'm actually looking at the XML. But it's 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 uh, very um, comfortable, if you will, to actually look at the properties inside a SMS. So another thing we we added, like like I've said a minute ago, is the um, uh, amount of rows that are flowing between each operator. And in this case, you see here, uh, I was running this query in parallel. This actually the scan was running in parallel. It was running in four threads, 
and I can see actually at this point in time how many rows each thread was reading. And in this case, I see it's not very well balanced. Obviously, in a perfect world with a perfect data distribution, um, and this is what the optimizer attempts to do, is to evenly distribute, in this case in a scan, each of the threads that is running the scan will take a more or less equal part of the workload. And therefore, you are able to finish the threads at essentially the same time, given there are, there are no uh, external conditions uh, occurring here. And in this case, what I can see is that a thread one actually read over 40,000 rows, and thread two only read 17,000. That may be, again, right here, a hint that we may have uh, outdated statistics, for example, or statistics with a wrong um, uh, sample uh, mode. So when you have updated statistics or created statistics, those, those did not have the accurate, uh, good enough sample. And you now have this kind of information right here. Um, so you can, you can start to proactively look into what you can act upon in your system. And another thing we added uh, that uh, can do away with the need to collect set statistics time is actually the overall um, time statistics for a specific operator. So you can see here, and this is not collapsed, this is collapsed, but you would see uh, again per thread, you could see the um, elapsed time that this operator took and the elapsed CPU time for this operator. Again, you, you, as you move up the tree, if you're in row mode, you would see these uh, values growing as you move up the tree. So you could easily identify which nodes and which branches in your uh, plan actually weigh the most at runtime and make those the primary focus of your attention when you're trying to do some query tuning. But like I said, we have been investing in X events, and this kind of information is also in a new X event uh, query thread profile. Now, this X event, as you may notice on the screen, is a debug channel X event. Um, so it's not, you need, if you want to use it, you need to pull down the debug, X, the debug channel. But as you can see, you can collect uh, this kind of information per node per, um, op per uh, operator. So it, it can be kind of chatty. Um, so um, you can use it in your test server just to, to, to get a feel of what kind of output you get. But if you're running a very heavy workload, a lot of executions coming in, and you're trying to collect this, you'll see a very chatty uh, output. So this is meant to be actually uh, for debug purposes, exactly. One caveat again, uh, just give me a minute is that while uh, the show plan time scale we've seen just now is shown in milliseconds, the X event is actually shown in microseconds. And that's shown in microseconds for CPU and total time. Um, as you can actually see on the screen, let me pull my mouse there. You, you see here that total time and CPU time is specifically in microseconds. And that's also in the name of the uh, event field itself. So it's easier to uh, understand what unit uh, we're looking at. Okay, so more into show plan. What else can we put into show plan that makes it a one-stop shop for uh, the query execution context? We've added information about trace flags, namely to understand which trace flags are active as we executed a specific query, because as we know, a number of trace flags may, be, may actually um, influence the optimizer to take different decisions on, on the plan shape and on the plan uh, uh, and a number of rules that are enforced. So it is very useful to understand what we have active at a certain point in time when you're running a, a query, because for example, in this case, I see on the top that I had three trace flags active um, in, the, in the system as I ran this query. And two of them, as I can see in the bottom, were not a compiled time, um, compile time trace flags, meaning they, they did not affect compilation of, of plans, but actually one did, 9481. 9481 is in this case forcing the, the old CE. So it is very important for me or for anyone analyzing a, a, a query plan to understand, hey, did I have any uh, outside interference, so to speak? And again, it's all about not only getting the context just right at the first time, but avoiding a round trip. Because let's say you were doing a query analysis on this plan, you were you were doing some recommendations, and someone uh, all, all of a sudden says, "Hey, but you know what? Actually, I was looking, and I have a, a 9481 trace flag uh, running globally on my server. 
or in this case, it was a session, uh, a session scope. Um, hey, is that important for you? Well, yes, that actually affects query optimizer. So it would be interesting to know that beforehand. Now you have that information right there. So yeah, so I know if it's a compile time um, trace flag or if it does not affect um, uh, compilation. And speaking of trace flags, um, in the last few months, we've been revamping the trace flag list in, in, in Microsoft Docs. Uh, you have this short URL here you can, you can make use of. So any, uh, any and all documented trace flags that uh, apply to current in market uh, versions and some many of them were scattered throughout some obscure KBs. We've pulled them all together and and you'll see um, documentation under under a single uh, URL. So it becomes easier to understand what is supported uh, versus some other trace flag you 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 found somewhere. And continue on on the trend of adding um, more context information to show plans. We've also now added the top weights. Now, it, again, as a context information, it's super important to understand if when I ran a certain query, what was the query or in this case, the session in which the query was running on, what is what was it waiting on? So it's super relevant to understand this information. And again, being in, in, in show plan precludes you from having to go to a different DME, DMV, getting the information from there, and then trying to more or less match the time codes that you got in the DMV with the time that this, um, this query ran. So it's now right here. So for example, uh, recently we, we, our Microsoft CSS got a case where just by using this, for, for example, they were seeing they had a, a lot of CX packet weights in that specific execution. And when they moved to the plan to look at it, um, they actually saw that most of the, uh, most sorry, they had SOS schedule yield, and most of the CPU was being taken actually by an exchange, exchange operator. Now, as a short-term mitigation, you can just run that with max DOP one because you would. It was the exchange operator itself that was uh, uh, taking a, a lot of time and 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 impacting the weights on the execution. So just by as a short-term mitigation, running max DOP one, you do away with that kind of operator, and uh, the query uh, performance stabilized. And then you can go in and and do some more deeper um, deeper query tuning. But if this is the sort of information that being right there provides you a context that allows quicker action, uh, understanding what you're seeing. Another another very I say very old connect request uh, connect item that we've um, that we've dealt with right now is actually adding the parameter data type to the parameter list in show plan. So it's it gets easier to detect um, when you're looking at type conversion issues. For example, you have a seek plan warning or something like that. Um, it, it gets easier again, not leaving the context of show plan, uh, especially if you're analyzing uh, remotely. Uh, you now have the information about um, the incoming parameter data type right there uh, as you are analyzing in line with other pieces of relevant data, as you can see here. And we did not stop. For example, we have uh, this kind of information, which is the query time stats. Uh, this is found in the root operator uh, of the, the plan. If it's a select, you will see in the, in the select um, in the select node, the root node. And this is the overall CPU time and elapsed time for the entire query. So not only did we add CPU time and elapsed time at the operator level, as, as we've seen a few minutes ago, but we actually also added for the overall query. It's super important for me to understand, again, when I'm looking at a query, a query plan, an actual query plan, uh, how much time did it take? Because that's a useful little piece of data uh, that, again, if being in show plan, I don't need to actually ask someone, hey, don't forget to make a note of how much time uh, the, the, the query took and send it to me when you send me the query plan. It's now right here. So you, you have that information uh, from the get-go. And well, you can see we've done a lot of changes to show plan lately. Um, another, another piece of information we added is about how resource governance settings are impacting the use of memory in, um, in a specific execution. So for example, we've added to the optimizer hardware dependent uh, um, properties the max compile memory. 
And that tells you what is the maximum memory that the optimizer had to compile um, and the, at compile time, obviously. But what this gives you is, if that query was running, for example, under a specific uh, resource pool, then if it is, let's say, a lower value than what you would expect if, if you were running on default, for example, you can understand uh, if you're having, for example, compile weights or something like that, you can see if you had a very uh, small amount of memory, for example, to run compilation, and that can have adverse effects. So this will will this has a direct correlation to uh, what resource um, uh, resource governance setting you had set for the context of this query specifically, and we also um, added max query memory, and, and this one again can map to uh, a resource governance setting. So we have uh, the max memory percent hint and the resource governor. So what you see here under max query memory is the potentially max memory that can be granted if needed for uh, a specific query so these are uh, system or slash resource governance settings that are right here and again make up some relevant uh, context information when you're analyzing a query plan so let me uh, quickly um, uh, show you how this how this can can work Brent, are there any questions or um, comments you'd like me to address? Is that kind of... Yeah, Hugo I'm... has a really good one. Yeah. Hugo Go says, with all of the additional runtime counters in the plan, are there plans to change the logic that computes percentage of cost to like then say this operator is actually 70% instead of running off the estimates? No, that is still not changing. We That is a an artificial... Uh, computation made uh, for from uh, compile time costs so mm -hmm. we're not addressing that uh, you go if you if you care to email me with some more details on why you would see that um, relevant or what use case you would have I'd love to to chat more about you mm -hmm. is this Hugo Cornelis by the way yeah oh yes yes right. <laughs> so I, I'd love to chat with you with you about this cool uh, okay so in this case um, Oh yeah, I have a note here because uh, I ran this demo once. I had optimized for other workloads, <laughs> and all sort of uh, stuff happened. So let me uh, create a session here. As you can see, I'm using the query thread profile uh, event. Can you see the? Is the size enough? For the I, I'm fine with it. I, okay. Usually, people were you know watching on good monitors. Except Hugo. Hugo, for some reason, is using a 12-inch screen, but everyone else is fine. <laughs> Can you, <laughs> can you use uh, uh, Zoom it or something? Uh, I'll use it as, as far as I can, as, as often as I can. <laughs> so uh, I just created an event session with uh, this query thread profile event. Uh, as you can see, I'm uh, uh, already collecting with a query hash signed and the query plan hash signed um, uh, properties instead of the, the ones that don't have a sign because I will I will want to correlate information I collect here with information from DMV, so I need to use that. And so let me uh, make sure I get the actual plan. Okay, let me run this. As you can see, there's a very simple query here on uh, on AdventureWorks, and uh, I'm forcing max UP one just for the simplicity of the output. And you'll see this in the um, in the X event trace. Um, and actually, just for the, the, I can then run it with uh, removing this hint just for the kick of it, because you'll see how chatty this uh, X event can can be. So I've collected this uh, trace here. Let me open that, and you can see it collected one event per per node. So I have here node ID one and so on and so forth. And this is node ID 6, for example. And I've collected a, a ton of information about IO, CPU, and, and other information relevant for, for the context of execution of this specific node. Now, why did I run max DOP1? Because let's say if I was running with, uh, I have four CPUs here, and if I set max DOP4 and this could use the four CPUs, I would see four times the number of entries here. So just for the sake of the demo, I didn't want to visually pollute this as much. Uh, so I kind of use max UP one, but you see, if you're running with max UP eight or even more than that, and you actually are able to uh, run with that degree of parallelism, you'll see this uh, event becoming very chatty very quickly. So please mind that when you're using it. 
So um, I could see here that node ID six in my plan um, was returned actually 120,000 rows and it did 1200 logical reads and it ran in row mode. So I have all sorts of uh, relevant information here, even the CPU time in, in microseconds. But let's say I want to uh, correlate this information with uh, some DMV or I want to go to CZM exec um, query stats. So I can, for example, grab the plan handle from here and go back and I'm able to easily correlate with information in my plan cache. So I have here the SQL handle. I have here all the relevant information about, uh, so for example, I can use the start offset and end offset to uh, cross apply with CZM exec query text and get the, the, the text from there uh, using, in this case, the, the um, SQL handle. So there are all sorts of uh, joins and cross applies you can do between relevant uh, DMFs and DMVs to, to get your own flavor of, uh, of uh, um, output. So I can see here that this is exec executed once. I can see the total worker time, last worker time, the, um, the output in terms of IO. So I can see my logical reads here. So these are all again new columns we've added to this um, to this DMV. I can see the the where is that? I can see the grant information. Uh, so memory grant information is here. Um, of course, this was just one execution. But as you look at this holistically over uh, a period of time, if more than one business cycle has, has gone through the 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 server, I am able to understand even by looking at this DMV um, whether I may have a memory misestimation issue in some query, for example. So there are all sorts of insights I can I can have from from this DMV here. But um, so I can go in and get the plan from the cache using this. Uh, oh, it's not there. No, it's not there because it's not the right handle. Okay. Um, so I can go in and get grab the cache plan. Obviously, the cache plan will miss all the runtime information because I'm getting this from the cache. Uh, but we've we've still made some additions to the cache plan, so I'll show you that later on. So you can you can finally also use uh, the information about query hash and query plan hash uh, that we captured in the um, in the X event trace. So for example, I'll go in and grab the um, the query hash signed um that i've cached, captured before and i'm going to use it here query plan hash was that the query hash or query plan hash i kind of got lost query hash so it's here and i'm now able to correlate directly so there's no more need for a clr function or make me guessing we now have a direct correlation between information we collect in x events and being able to retrieve that information from from uh, several dmvs any questions here? Muted myself. Nope, no, you're good. Okay. <laughs> so uh, moving on, more investments in show plan. We've added, um, uh, th so this, this is a, a possibly a, a, a known uh, warning that you might have seen. We've, been, we've added this since SQL Server 2012, but it's main, basically you had information about hey, uh, memory grant took X amount of time uh, to, to be given to this execution. And therefore, for example, in this case, let's say we ran the query in 41 seconds, but we see the warning here that it needed to actually wait 40 seconds for memory grant. So that's a relevant piece of data again when you're analyzing this. But that's basically what you had. Uh, however, uh, so we've, we've added more information about uh, memory usage, and I'm going to show you some more warnings going forward. Uh, this is what I've shown you just now uh, live. So new columns in CZM exec query stats, everything about memory grants. So um, for example, uh, here I have a query that was run again only once, this was part of the demo, but I see, hey, the last grant was, oops, sorry. The last grant was almost 800 megs. And how many, how much memory did it use? Not even one kilobyte. Talk about um, misestimating memory or misusing memory. Even. And why is this relevant? Think about 
a number of queries running in your system that are, for example, taking one gigabyte of grants and using a couple of kilobytes. Uh, that will hinder the, uh, the ability to actually concurrently run workload in your server. So therefore, you will want to be attentive to this sort of misestimations because waste is not only about wasting memory, it's about not being able to have your SQL server run other queries in, in, in as concurrently as you could potentially if you kind of have more, um, more reasonable uh, memory grants as it relates to the actual usage of the memory. Um, and if anything else fails, we've actually added a couple of uh, hints that you can use. So the min grant percent and the max grant percent that you can, if anything else fails in terms of trying to uh, adjust the, 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 your query and the underlying statistics and whatnot to make sure the engine actually gets a better estimation, you will then be able to administratively, if you will, be able to um, uh, drop the ceiling, for example, the max grant percent to a value that is more uh, close to the actual usage of memory that you're seeing. But we'll, we'll see more about this later. So that kind of information is obviously then also inside Showplan uh, XML itself. Uh, yeah, this was uh, what I was calling for. So having this information right there in, in show plan, it's super important to detect uh, if this sort of scenario is happening. So not only if you look at your workload holistically through CZM exact query stats, but if you're analyzing one single um, plan execution, then you're able to also uh, get that specifically from, from show plan. But although this information is there, uh, it may be missed uh, with with all the other stuff that's inside show plan that you're uh, that you're mining. So what we've added is also another warning that has to do with memory grants. Uh, and this one has three conditions. I'm not going to bother you with the conditions here. You I'll I'll I'll, I'll make the uh, slide deck available so you can go and have a look at it later. Uh, but you can see here in the in the uh, right side of the screen. Um, where I was running a certain query and I got a runtime warning saying this query detected excessive grants. And this may impact reliability. Reliability meaning in this case, the ability to do more concurrent workload. That's kind of a measure of reliability. So in this case, I can see the initial grant was almost 300 megs. And guess what? I used 176 kilobytes. Again, this is not a good use of memory uh, for my for my uh, a good sound server that is trying to serve a lot of concurrent workload. So uh, if anything else fails, I could have, for example, use the uh, max uh, percent hint here. And if I kind of have the notion that this kind of query profile is always overestimating memory and I have no other way of uh, addressing this, I can just go in and say, OK, if if from the executions I've seen, I take a max of, let's say, 200 kilobytes of memory. I can actually uh, set an artificial ceiling for memory grants and just make sure that um, the, the grant is not higher than a certain amount. And therefore, SQL Server can have more queries running concurrently, as long as workers are available, obviously. And so we've added also a, mem a memory grant usage X event to 2016 to detect this kind of uh, scenarios. Now, mind you that for, for this X event, so it doesn't become too chatty, we've added, we actually only uh, fire the event if the grant has a minimum of five megabytes. So only those uh, fairly larger queries, if you will, in terms of memory grant, uh, if, they, if we detect inaccurate and insufficient grants here, then we'll fire the event. So yeah, and this 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 were the options I was talking about. So in SQL 2016 and 2014 SP2, we 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 give you a, an option to administratively address uh, grant sizes. So you have uh, the this query um, hint here, the max grant percent, and in this case, if I set it like option max grant percent equals 0 0.1, I'm saying that at max 0 0.1 or 0 0.1 of the um, available memory under the resource, the, my specific resource governor uh, uh, resource pool that I'm running on uh, may be available for this query. So mind that the, the usage of this hint has to be taken into account um, where in resource governor am I running this. If I haven't uh, set up resource governor, uh, I'm running under default. So therefore, the uh, max available would be potentially the limit of max server memory. So you're fine there from that perspective. But if you're actively using resource governor, mind you that you need to take those, those computations into account. 
So obviously the valid uh, input here would be between zero and and one hundred percent. As you would expect, max per percent needs to be bigger or equal than min percent. And the reason we have a floating point value here is um, we want to allow you to be very granular in the amount of memory you set for either min or max. For example, if we just have as uh, just have it as a, a um, an integer, let's say the minimum we allowed would be 1%, think of a, a one terabyte memory machine. And that's not so uncommon nowadays. Uh, in the case that we've just seen that I was taking 800 megabytes to use 200K, well, 1% was still overkill. So in this case, I would be using 10 gigabytes. So that's not good. So that's why I've, uh, we've uh, we started to use a uh, floating point value. So let me just give you a, am I running on time? Uh, yeah, halfway through, okay. Yeah. So we're good. Um, let me just go back to my uh, server here. By the way, my, my backpack finished, so that's good. I can now. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It does. What's your problem? Oh, it's Mac, Mac I'm Grant. Sorry. OK. OK, so uh, this is a super artificial query. I'm actually forcing, as you can see here, but uh, forcing a, a memory issue. But uh, to, to not only give you a, a gist of how the, the uh, warning surfaces, but also for you to see how you can use this kind of hints, in this case, mean grand percent, but you can use it max, max grand percent, how you can use it in line. In this case, I'm artificially setting that, hey, the mean grand percent would be 20% of the available memory. In this case, I'm not using um, a resource governor, so I would fall into the default pool. And in this case, I've set uh, 16 gigabytes as the max of memory for my uh, for this specific uh, instance. So, when let me make sure I get the actual plan. So when I do this, and let me let it execute. So you can see it's absolutely bogus data here. The point was really to uh, create a, a memory condition. So as I go to the actual execution plan here, I already see that I have warnings. And now if I expand on this. I can see that, hey, um, you've hit a excessive grant warning. Oops. Uh, you've hit an excessive grant warning here. And this will impact the, the reliability of your server. And see, in this case, uh, 600 uh, megabytes, almost 600 megabytes of grant. And in the end, I only used 350K. So talk about an, a misestimation. Obviously, in this case, I, I fabricated it. Um, in, and, uh, and, and so you, you may, but if you find this in the wild, one thing you can do is, um, as you try to at least, uh, mitigate it administratively is set max grand percent to whatever, uh, let's say I would be happy with 0 0.01 of the memory on my server for this query. And if anything else fails, you still have this fallback, uh, strategy to deal with this, um, misestimated grants, mis misestimated grants. Now, if I look at the properties of my uh, plan, I will see that um, in terms of optimizer hardware uh, dependent properties, I have here the max compile memory available at compile time. So as I've shown you in the, in the slide deck uh, previously, and if I go specifically to memory grant info, I'm able to see a lot of information here, like the granted information. Let me bump it up. The granted information here. Uh, I can see the max query memory. I can see the max use memory. So these this these two pieces of data is where the are being taken into account to trigger or not that uh, warning. Um, and I'm also able to see the um, the the max query memory, as I've said, is part of your. Um, your resource governance setting if you, if you had set one. Um, I can also set a, a uh, event session with that query memory grant usage X event. So let's set one. Um, I need to actually have the right uh, path here. So very quickly change this. Oh, come on. Okay, so let me set up this uh, X event session and I'm grant, and I'm going to um, run this, uh, the same query um, in the scope of this uh, collection. And let's see what fires up inside the, um, 
the plan. So as you can see, obviously I have the same uh, memory grant warning here. And looking at the X event trace, I can see that this fires a memory grant usage uh, event. Again, remember that it only fires if the grant memory was above five megabytes, which in this case it was. And I can see here, let's say if I'm, I'm collecting this kind of event over a, a larger period of time, um, this is uh, being an X event is also very lightweight, which means that if I'm firing this every now and again, I may be able to, be able to get a gist of whether my workload is kind of suffering from this concurrency problem, if you will, uh, often or not. So I can see that uh, this is the grant of memory, uh, and I can see the used memory here, and I can see the um, the usage percent of the grant of memory was not even one percent. So it's it's very very uh, skewed here. So I also have the query plan hash signed, and the query hash signed, and I can take this, go into my plan cache, or even take the plan handle, go into my plan cache, retrieve the plan from there, retrieve the query text from there, and then I can go into my test server and whatnot, and kind of find of uh, what, what's happening with this one. Again, taking advantage of all the information I can uh, have in the actual plan when I, when I run it, when I collect it. Okay, so. So in terms of warnings, and yes, I mean, uh, almost half of my session is all about show plan. That's where we've done extensive uh, uh, investments here. Um, in, the, in the left, you can see what kind of information you have, for example, for a sort warning uh, up until SQL Server 2016. You, you kind of saw a sort warning, you, you went to see the properties of that operator, and it told you, oh, this um, spill data using a spill level one, which didn't tell you a lot unless you, you went to documentation. Uh, and that's it. You had no other information. So to kind of understand how costly that spill would be or not, uh, even though in principle a spill would be costly anyway, uh, you'd maybe have to collect set statistics I.O that we've seen that we can do away with it, with, with uh, that kind of, that kind of uh, collection right now. But in the scope of the um, sort warning itself, we can now see on the right uh, that it gives you a lot more information. I can see that, okay, it's built with level one, meaning I only needed one pass through the data to build the sort table, but I've spilled through 12 threads. And uh, I wrote X amount of pages, 4,400. Uh, and I've also um, uh, used a lot of memory to, to uh, execute this sort. So I have a lot more context information on how relevant it is in the context of, a, let's say, a very large and complex plan for me to address sooner rather than later the fact that I'm doing a, a, a sort spill here. The same kind of context information was added to hash spills. So you can see on the uh, left there, the warning before was just, hey, this, um, this hash match uh, spilled with spill level one. Oh, great, okay, uh, but no more information. And now, since uh, 2016 RTM, and we backported this to 2014 SP2, and we're actually um, moving back a lot of this information that you're seeing uh, up until now, uh, we're actually backporting to an upcoming service pack uh, for SQL Server 2012. So um, we will have, uh, as far as much as possible, we'll have a, a match in terms of troubleshooting artifacts between uh, between uh, different versions. So you can see, so as I was saying on the right, how much more useful information you get for the context of this uh, hash spill uh, in, in the newer versions of SQL Server. And again, as we as we would, uh, that has that, that its respective counterparts in, in, in uh, X events. And you can see in the top, um, the, the only kind of information we had, much like X uh, show plan, in the scope of the X event hash warning was the recursion level. That's it, that's a spill level ID. And now we have much more information as you can see highlighted in the bottom in more recent versions of SQL Server. And similarly in sort warning, the same thing. So we get the same kind of information. Namely, uh, we even get the, the specific uh, information on what kind of IO we did on, on the work table that is supporting, uh, in this case, the, the, the sort warning. Okay, so, Let's move on to another um, another problem space, which is understanding how to detect if our predicates are being used efficiently by the engine 
to um, to do as little I.O. and use as little resources as, as possible. So when you're looking at the uh, query plan, and as we've seen several examples today, when you see the actual number of rows by returned by any operator, that means only that those are the rows output by the operator after whatever predicate uh, needed to be applied was. So those are not the actual number of rows you get from the underlying scan table or, or seeking on an index or whatever. And that may be a huge uh, thing to look at. This is a, usually a scenario that is hidden from the actual execution plan. For example, I see a scan or I even I see a seek that's underlying doing a uh, range scan and I see it's returning 10 rows, but it's taking a long time. Or I even see a lot of CPU or a lot of IO if I'm, uh, for example, collecting set statistics IO, or nowadays looking at the IO statistics for that scan. Um, they kind of don't match. Why am I retrieving 10 rows and I'm doing 100,000 uh, uh, reads? So the query plan doesn't really reflect that very, very uh, explicitly. And uh, so now, now what can we do? Now, let me just, before I go into what we've done to, to um, address this problem space, kind of give you a, a visual um, a visual um, uh, representation of what it is what it means to search without predicate push down so in this case i have here uh, my sales order detail table in my in my um, uh, in my database um, adventure works and this is the query that i'm running so i'm selecting product id from this table and i have a couple of predicates there a modified table where I have uh, between uh, with a couple of dates and order quantity where it's bigger or equal than 10. Now, uh, when I run this query, uh, I'm, I can see that I'm doing an index seek here. And by the name of the index, IX underscore modified date um, and, and some more, I can see that, uh, or in this case, um, you'll see that the modified date is the first column in the key of this index, meaning that as you might know, the underlying histogram uh, will be built over modified date. Now, in this case, uh, this seek is actually representing a range scan over the modified date part of my predicate. So between uh, January 2011 and January 2012. And now, uh, so this would be the actual rows returned by that index seek. Uh, and now I would need to apply a second operator, in this case, a filter, to go and take the output of that range scan and be able to filter down the order quantity um, part of my predicate. So I would have the actual rows be trimmed down to that part of the predicate itself. And I would actually have the output of my query. Now, this is not very efficient. So by default, what SQL Server, yes, so this would be my result set. So by default, what SQL Server does as often as possible, and this is actually very difficult uh, to, to, to um, artificially uh, show you an example where SQL Server is not doing this, is pushing down the, our predicates to the storage engine as much as possible. So instead of um, needing filter operators and wasting CPU time there to, do, to doing uh, after the fact filtering on my data, SQL Server ties to uh, resolve that at the storage engine level as much as possible. So here, looking at the same table, I have the same exact query. And uh, I'm doing my range scan. But see here, how my range scan is actually already uh, looking, uh, scanning through the data that is, that's matching both of my predicates. And that's because this index uh, is first column on modified date, second column on order quantity. So SQL Server detecting this, detecting that I have the right index for my predicate, is able to push down both predicates to the storage engine and is able to read only the relevant data uh, for my output, meaning the actual rows that I see, in this case, in a perfect scenario, will be the actual rows that were read and not much difference there. Yeah, so I can see that in this plan, I actually done away with the filter operator because I was able to push down both predicates here. So let me let me show you this in action uh, and why this is uh, this is relevant here. Uh, I lost my, okay. So closing this, I have too much stuff open. Um, okay. Okay. So 
uh, I created here, uh, I bumped up the sales order detail table. Um, so I, I won't do that anymore. Uh, okay, let me clear the cache here. Okay, so in this execution here, in the first one, I will be uh, disallowing uh, non sarcable expressions to be pu being pushed down to the storage engine. So you see here, uh, this is the query that I was running in in that visual uh, in the visual animation. Um, I'm using here an undocumented trace flag <laughs> just for the sake of um, not pushing down uh, the predicate to the storage engine. Like I said, it's super difficult to actually, at least for me, I couldn't come up with a case where I could artificially uh, or naturally, sorry, uh, prevent the storage engine from from pushing down the predicate. So uh, that's why I had to kind of force it. Uh, please do not, for the life <laughs> of you, run this in a production server because you'll be hurting yourself a lot. Uh, okay, so now, and the second one, uh, I'm allowing whatever SQL Server wants to do by default to do it. So I'm going to grab the actual execution plans for both of them. Uh, oops, I need to be in the right database. That would be good. Okay. So I got two execution plans here. These are actually the execution plans uh, we were seeing before. I see here the my cluster index scan, and uh, how can I detect uh, if I did if I was doing a good use or not uh, of uh, predicate pushdown? In this case, I know I was not doing a predicate pushdown. So this is not the one I wanted. It's this one. Okay. So what new stuff do we have here? We have. Uh, we used to have only uh, estimated number of rows and the actual number of rows, right? And so in this case, the scan was actually scanning everything. I, uh, and I see that the engine was estimated to read the entire table and the actual output was also the entire table. I now have two extra um, properties here, which is the number of rows read actually read by the engine, this case is the same, so it's not a very good use of any predicate pushdown because I actually did none, um, and the estimated rows to be read. So both of these actually will be present in the cached query plan, meaning, for example, if you do some sort of uh, uh, analysis over your plan cache, um, you can look for where you have a large difference between these two, uh, between the estimated number of rows and the estimated number of rows to be read that even from a, a, a compilation perspective will give you already a hint if the engine is expecting to do a good use of predicate pushdown or not. Now, in the second one, yeah, in the second one, um, I was able to uh, see that the estimated number of rows was um, 2,100, but the estimated number of rows to be read was still 121,000. So again, although I did use predicate pushdown, not very efficient use of it. Why? Well, in this case, uh, remember the first column in the in the index that was also part of a predicate was the modified date, and it it goes it spills over the tipping point for a seek. So in this case, I just read the entire thing. Um, so in the, this can also tell me that hey, if this predicate is very relevant, it's very uh, recurrent. I may need to kind of. Uh, uh, change my index a little bit to be able to have a more focused use of predicate pushdown. Now, I can see here that although the actual number of rows from this scan were 1600, I actually still had to read to the entire thing. So again, in this case, I was using uh, predicate pushdown, but from an I.O. perspective, not very relevant. Now, I still have, and let me go here and look at these two, I still have uh, a relevant difference. Where is it? So if I go to the root node of my query one, the one I'm not doing the predicate push down, I go to query time stats and look here. This ran in uh, 200 milliseconds and my CPU time was 26. Yes, this is a very small query, but try to imagine something that really uh, running in production concurrently over larger tables really uh, bumps up these numbers. And uh, on the second one, where I did away with the filter, I actually cut down CPU time by 50%, actually a little bit more than that. And the elapsed time was cut down uh, four times. So 
yes, this is not the perfect example. Uh, I will I will have one in a few minutes. This is not the perfect example where you'll see predicate pushdown actually uh, relieving your I/O usage. But by the simple fact that I didn't need to use a filter in this case, uh, I was able to cut down on other kinds of resources like CPU, and that also cut down on the uh, elapsed time. So it is still a relevant strategy to allow SQL Server to do this as often as possible. Now, uh, yeah, let me drop this index here. OK, so let's try to unleash uh, predicate pushdown to see it in all its glory and to understand that what it's doing right now in each and every SQL Server that you're running on. So again, very simple query on, um, on AdventureWorks. Uh, this one is, so we'll be looking at where last name is S something, and first name will have to be John. And in the second one, I get all the Smiths, uh, whatever starts with J. So let's look at the actual plan for these ones. Okay, so um, I see the output for each one, as, as I would expect. I have two Johns here. One of them is actually a Smith. On the other, I have all the Smiths, whatever starts with, with a J. Looking at the execution plans, now let's see uh, information about the, the range scan. So I'm doing index six on both. Um, but as I see by my predicates, I'm actually applying predicates here. Uh, so I'm actually doing a, a, a scan on a range of rows uh, in the scope of this seek. And I'm able to see that in this case, I read 2,100 rows and the I can see the table cardinality also. And on, let me just go back here. Okay, it's easier to look at here. So I can see that the number of rows that were read were 2,100, but the actual number of rows was just two. So not the best use of, um, of predicate pushdown per se. Although, as I saw, I had my table cardinality is about 20,000. So uh, I was still able to looking, uh, the, opt the optimizer looking at the predicate, looking at the existing indexes, was able to do an uh, efficient enough use of, um, of IO. I can also see here how the estimations were very close uh, in terms of uh, the amount of rows to, be, to, to read in the underlying um, uh, table, were very close between the estimations and the actual uh, rows that were read. I can see that I was uh, estimated 2100, and that's basically what I did in reality. OK, so again, by scrubbing your cache and looking for these sort of scenarios may give you a hint of whether you're doing better or not so efficient use of uh, predicate pushdown. But let's look at this one. So in this one, I'm able to see uh, I can see here that the actual number of rows. Oh, sorry. The actual number of rows was 14 and the number of rows read was also 14. And by the way, this is using the same index. And I can even see by my estimations that they were matching, which means that this is a perfect example of using my underlying index design efficiently to cut down as much as possible on I.O. In this case, I was able to uh, do a very efficient range scan here. And um, in case you're wondering where this is coming from, uh, for example, in the first one, where you can see that my estimation was around 20, oh, sorry, 2,100 uh, rows here. Uh, let's look at actually uh, the statistic that supports the index I'm, uh, I'm cutting, currently seeking on. So if you notice here, I'm actually using a new uh, DMF that we've released just now in SQL Server 2016 SP1 CU2, which is a CZM DB stats histogram. So um, this will essentially give you the same uh, uh, output as running DBC, DBCC show statistics with histogram. And, but, but the difference is I'm able to use it programmatically and therefore apply some computations or some whatever I want to do with that, with that data. So yeah, so if I look at the range where I was looking at all the S's because uh, the last name is the um, is the first um, column in this uh, statistic. Therefore, it's, it's where the histogram is built on. That my first query, look at the last name predicate. So I can apply the same predicate to my um, to my uh, query that's looking at the histogram and actually get a feel of how many rows are coming from there. So 
pretty uh, similar. And I know that for that query, I was actually uh, looking at the histogram and retrieving the the, the estimation from there. Now, uh, remember the second one? Let's look at it again. This one, I was estimating 14 rows to be read overall, which is actually the actual number of rows I got. Sorry, I was estimating 35. Uh, and that was also the estimation of rows to be read, 35, right? So let's keep this number in mind, 35.32. Now, let me look at the uh, histogram for, so remember the last name here, I was, I'm looking for Smith. Let me look at the histogram to see um, if I'm getting the 35 rows from there. Well, no, I kind of have 103 rows that cover all the Smiths. So I'm not getting, getting a direct estimation from uh, the histogram itself. Uh, so where is this coming from? Uh, I can do something like, uh, yeah, something like this. What is that? Oh, this, this is actually the same. Okay, so where is that coming from? Uh, for that, we need to dive a little bit deeper. So for example, I'm, I'm able to use the query optimizer estimate cardinality X event to actually see where that is coming from. So I'm gonna create this X event session. Oh, already exists, okay. Uh, now I'm gonna run it, run the, the same query where last name equals Smith and first name anything with a, with a, starting with a J. And let's see the output here. Okay, got it. Uh, still have my, oops, still have my 35.32 um, estimated number of rows there. And let's look at the output of this. Okay, so, um, is this the same query? Uh, yes. Okay. So I can see here from the stats collection that I have a, this, I can see the, the estimation already here. So I can look at the calculator list here. I can see that, hey, I was using exponential back off. This was the calculator used for this one. Here is the here are the selectivities that were used for each of the predicates. So, uh, for last name, I loaded up uh, stats ID three, and this is a selectivity I got, and that's coming directly from the from the uh, from the stats. But now I've I've uh, calculated a tri based selectivity for my first name um, column inside the person table. So what does it all mean? Uh, I'm using exponential back off. That's a relevant uh, piece of data. Here are my selectivities, 0 0.005 and 0 0.118. So how do I use this to understand uh, where, where that came from? So I can do something like this. So exponential back off, it's as simple as taking the, um, in this case, I'm looking at the uh, lowest selectivity times the square root of the second lowest selectivity, and I will be doing this until the fourth one, times the table cardinality I've seen before, it's 19,972. So if I run this, I actually get the uh, roundup number of the selectivity I got. So this is where the uh, my selectivity is coming from. So I'm able to get all sorts of relative information just by looking at the at the execution plan and understanding these differences between estimated rows and estimated rows to be read. The number of actual rows coming after the predicate was applied versus the overall number of rows that I had to read to resolve whatever predicate. Okay, and that becomes very relevant uh, when we're, we're looking at um, this sort of scenarios. So uh, in the final, uh, we're approaching the end, I'll actually take the full 90 minutes. Uh, to, to move a little bit of um, an, analyzing specific query um, uh, performance, let's let's move back a little bit. This is something that I'm sure possibly every DBA in the call, if any, uh, has exper experienced. Someone calls, my application is slow. Um, every, all eyes are on me. Everyone's pointing at the DBA um, to fix whatever problem there, there may be there, and he doesn't even know what's happening. So. Possibly you'll grab your toolbox, 
running PSS Diag, running your uh, pre-customized X event traces, maybe running Profiler, hopefully not. Uh, but the point is, all of that, that all of that is collecting data after the fact, meaning as the problem is occurring, you are collecting data so that you can then take it, that, that data, go somewhere else, repro, do some analysis, and then if you find a mitigation, deploy it. But while that's happening, you have possibly someone screaming at you because they're desperate, hey, our business is, is down because there's some problem with the database and, and we, we can't put our finger to it. And so what if I could do actually live query troubleshooting? And Although, yes, you may have understood at this point, I'm talking about live query stats. It's much more than that. I'll show you why. So the, the point is to have in the ability to do in-flight query execution stats, we need to enable something that is actually a mouthful, the query execution statistics profile infrastructure. This needs to be enabled on demand in the engine to be able to start tracking uh, live query execution progress. But it has a, a, a payment. It's, it's a costly uh, proposal. We need to, uh, when we enable this profile infrastructure, we, the cost overhead can go up to 75%. That's what we've measured with TPCCH kind of uh, uh, workloads. So if I'm trying to do live troubleshooting in an already bogged down system, it makes bad things actually worse. So uh, this is why customers, and I'm sure that you guys are not running this all the time in your servers, and you'll still rever revert back to that pattern of trying to collect data, moving it to some, some other server that has the same database and trying to see uh, if there's something wrong with the plans, if an index would help here or there, or whatever other mitigation you, you're trying to deploy. Because you don't have that ability to do uh, low-cost live troubleshooting in your production servers. So enters lightweight profiling. This is what we've, 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 we've the kind of situation we've unleashed. There's the same red alert. Everyone calls in. My application is slow. Everyone's pointing out to a DBA, but now the DBA can tap into an in-flight execution, find the hotspot, deploy the mitigation, and uh, did, did away with a lot of time needed moving back and forth some data and uh, going to an, a second server and understanding what's, what was going on. And why is this possible? So what's the impact with running live query troubleshooting, so live query statistics, with this new lightweight uh, profiling infrastructure. So uh, as you can see on the screen now, and this was measured with TPCC-like workloads, running the normal, I, I'll call it here legacy, but that's that shouldn't be, it's, it's a normal because it, it will exist uh, side by side. The normal uh, profiling infrastructure with no running X events, just, just running the, 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 the infrastructure, uh, will have an overhead up to 75%, as I've said. Uh, in Service Pack 1, 2016S Service Pack 1, uh, we made enhancements to a side-by-side -side lightweight profiling infrastructure that has an overhead that we've measured between 1.5 to 2%. Now, for uh, the majority of workloads out there, if you're not running already CPU bound, and if you if your workload, for example, a a, a trade uh, trade market um, uh, trades stock application, for example, um, that needs very low latency and even adding 1% there is already uh, uh, an overhead. So if you're not running in these uh, kind of edge scenarios, m our recommendation is uh, uh, have this profiling infrastructure active all the time because it unleashes the possibility of going in and doing live troubleshooting with a very, very small overhead, as you can see here, up to 2%, which most workloads can survive with a 2% overhead on this. Now, let me show you how you can actually uh, do this in minutes. So uh, let me, I'm still on the same server, yes. Okay, I'm gonna run some scenario workload here, running. Okay. Come on. What happened here? Am I not using this? I'm using the right one. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's say uh, I'm running some workload. I'm the DBA of this system, and I'm I'm experiencing the scenario there. Someone is calling me and saying, "Hey, my system is down," or that part of my application is. Uh, is working is very slow. Uh, please uh, fix my problem. So what I can do is I can go in 
In this case, let's say I'm using Activity Monitor. Uh, I don't know how many of you use this or not, uh, just, just for the, the, the kick of it. So I'm using uh, Activity Monitor here. Uh, let me look at Active Expensive Queries. Oh, wow. OK. A uh, few here. I can look at any query here, right click, and show live execution plan. Okay, so I'm able to see. Okay, this is one is done, so this was probably not the case. Let me look at this one. Right click, show live execution plan. So this is what enables me by running that lightweight profiling infrastructure all the time. I can tap into any running execution. In this case, I'm using Activity Monitor. Uh, there are obviously ways to do it with with DMVs. Show live execution plan, and okay, this is still not the one. So I'm looking for the query that uh, someone is complaining is taking a long time. Oh. Look at this one, elapsed time is already huge. A lot of logical reads, a lot of allocated um, allocated memory here. So right click, show live execution plan. Oh, I missed it, come on. What is that? And while I was talking, I lost my query. Okay, here it is. No, it's not this one. Oh, come on. <laughs> don't you oh, okay. this is exactly what a real life one is like too <laughs> found it okay well this doesn't look good right uh just look at these estimations here <laughs> this is ginormous right uh yeah probably something's less than right with this execution here uh, i'm estimated a gigantic number of executions uh the operator cost is through the roof um yeah this actually doesn't look good and as i uh navigate through the um through the plan uh, okay i see it's table spool here okay i see all sorts of wrong with this plan right so and this is the plan that that, that someone was complaining of so what do i have here also have a gigantic estimated number of rows the sub three cost is is huge so yeah, that's probably the thing I need to be looking at. Uh, let me look at the query. So one thing I can do is, by the way, this button, if you missed it, is everywhere in SSMS. Uh, you can just click on it and have a properly formed query appear uh, so that you can edit. Um, OK, so this is the query I'm running. Ah, OK. My devs don't have a lot of faith in the new CE, apparently. Um, someone deployed this, and they're using the old CE. I'm a bit more optimistic. Let me try to actually go to the right database and run this. I'll leave out the, the forcing of the old CE there. Oh, I'm done? Not even one second? And OK, this was done also. Uh, but I, it took a, a, what is that? But it took several minutes to run. It's hurting my, my performance in production. And I was able to, at this case, see, well, just do away with this trace flag and you'll be fine. Uh, my execution plan is much simpler. Uh, it does not have um, the, well, for example, if you go here, um, I was looking at this uh, nested loop with a lot of misestimations all throughout the tree. And I can see here that. I've changed the, the, the join order is different. The type of joins is different. All the plan is not suffering from uh, um, huge differences between estimated rows and actual rows. For example, here I see almost 300 actual rows and 500 estimated rows. So it's fairly uh, close. And the, the plan just, I just was able to, in this very simple case, uh, do live query troubleshooting just by having the power to go in and seeing live what's happening in my server. Now, how did I do that? Um, live query troubleshooting it can be, yeah, okay, so before I go there, just, just a quick difference. Um, you still have re regular profiling that is uh, fine to get uh, full runtime statistics for a query plan. You can enable processional globally. Um, actually, if I click uh, in, in show, in, let's say I'm in SMS and I click the button um, show live query stats for that query that I have in my window right now. So not through the DMVs, not through uh, Activity Monitor like I saw now. I'm still using the uh, normal profiling or the regular profiling. I'm using Lightweight. 
if I enable it and then I go to the to the DMVs or in this case I go to um, to activity monitor and I'm able to uh, uh, plug into a running execution. Uh, the, there's one caveat with using lightweight profiling is that as you can see on the screen here, um, we do not do CPU tracking that has a huge cost. So we still track IO. Okay, we still get all the other execution statistics that I've been uh, showing you so far, apart from CPU. So if you really need to uh, track your queries and get the CPU time uh, um, at any point in time, then uh, you need to enable regular profiling, although it has that huge overhead. So again, I fall back to my previous recommendation of using lightweight profiling all the time. You can enable it uh, by, for example, with uh, trace flag 7412. It's a fully documented trace flag. You can go to our trace flag docs page and, and see it there. Uh, I also have a blog post post on this that has other ways of enabling both the regular and the lightweight profiling infrastructure uh, so you can get more details more details there so we're almost at the top of my time um, just want to um, leave you with some um, with some other thoughts before we we close here um, the query story UI you might be familiar with it at this point in time um, we've we we have several let's say, um, features inside Query Store UI itself, for example, the ability to look at two plans for the same query hash uh, and compare them both. And like we're seeing on the screen here, uh, I'm able to understand what areas are similar, what areas are different. Uh, I can even see in the properties window here between a couple of plans that I'm looking at, which uh, properties are different because I have this mathematical different symbol here. In this case, I can see the cache plan size is different. I can also see the CE version between these two plans is different. So I have a number of uh, um, important data between uh, different between the two plans that jump, just jumps out to me. Um, and we've enabled this uh, in, the, in the scope of Query Store, but also standalone. Um, just some more investments we're doing in SSMS itself. For example, in the current release, the latest V17 that you can download, show plan comparison already has support for multi-statement show plans, meaning if I had in the previous versions, a, if I'm looking at a, a plan that has multiple um, uh, statements, I was only able to compare the first statement. Now think of where the first statement is a used database that pretty much killed it, right? So we have support for multi-statement, we now have uh, as we've seen, the per operator level performance stats is shown in the properties window in show plan. If you're still using an older version of SSMS, you won't see that. You need to go and look at the XML itself. Um, Query store on all, all the um, on all the um, the uh, reports there, we've added the ability to filter by a number of different plans. For example, I just want to filter for anything that has two or more plans. So I'm able to see that kind of scenario right there just by filtering on Query Store on any kind of report. Um, upcoming, and you can already see it in, in the RC versions of V17, we have a couple of new, new reports in Query Store. You have their queries with forced plans. For example, if you're using Query Store and you've forced a few plans, it was kind of cumbersome for you to quickly understand, hey, which plans are forced? and how can I uh, do something about them? So we now added a new report that will show you all the force plans. Um, and we also have something else baked into, um, in, into SSMS, which is the ability to open up a plan and start, and we'll start introducing something we call query analysis scenarios. We will look at the plan and we will give you some hints on what you can improve or try to improve your plan by looking at some heuristics in the plan itself. For example, uh, I see CE differences here. Um, please go in and try to update statistics, or maybe this has something to do with an input parameter. Uh, go and see if we're doing some conversion there. So we, we're starting to build intelligence into, into SSMS that you can use with any version, obviously. Uh, and this that, that, that will ship already in, in V17. So I still had a demo on Query Store and plan comparison. I'm on the top of my time, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip that one. Uh, hopefully, I've been able to uh, give you enough information about all the stuff that's new in show plan and in terms of troubleshooting uh, and diagnostics artifacts that you can leverage for, a multiple, for multiple scenarios. And I've shown you how, how you can use some of them to gain the specific kind of insights to then take the next step, which is to mitigate it. 
uh, leave you just with a few bookmarks. Um, our GitHub has a ton of uh, solutions there. Uh, we have also our team blog. Like I said before, uh, for the lightweight profiling, you can get a lot more insight if you look at a uh, blog post I've done recently. So uh, there's also the trace flags here. And uh, thank you for all that we're able to stick until the end. Very cool. Thank you, sir. Uh, lots of people uh, uh, chiming in with, you know, they're going to use this on query tuning. So good stuff. Very good stuff. That's what we like to hear. Thank and please, you. if you have any feedback through the blog, through Twitter, reach back to us. We'd love to get feedback. Uh, we'll have to also understand what's working right, but also what's working wrong, and we can try to to address it. So thank well, you very much. I, man, I would just like to say, if for in terms of feedback, I know especially with Eric being on here too, the new stuff that's in execution plans is fantastic. And same thing with the memory grant fields and the DMBs. It's just been wonderful. It makes uh, performance tuning so much easier. You guys are amazing. So Well, thank you for that. On behalf of the team, thank you very much. Would you mind if I ask you a quick question about vNext? Of course, if I can uh, answer, so yes. Adaptive joins. Yes. There's a, new, there's a new query plan operator for those. Yes. Are those going to be in cache plans or only in actual plans? Uh, that is a runtime. Um... Ah, bummer. Is there going to be anything in the plan that says if there was an adaptive join use, or is that only runtime stuff? It's fine if you don't. I'm just, I'm just poking. I... <laughs> or you can't say. That. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Pedro Lopes, everybody. Fantastic. Good job. Uh, round of virtual applause. Thank you so much, man. That was fantastic. Thanks for volunteering thank your you time. Very much. We really appreciate it.